Hey everyone, welcome to a special episode of Device Squad and Anexapod. For those who haven't heard, Anexnet is excited to welcome Propelix as the newest member of the Anexnet team. If you are a Device Squad listener, then welcome to the Anexapod, the official podcast for Anexnet. Here on the Anexapod, we talk technology for the enterprise, covering infrastructure, app dev, analytics, and anything else that is shiny. I'm your host, Ned Bellavance, Director of Cloud Solutions at Nexnet. And for those of you that are Anexapod listeners... Welcome to another episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix and Anexanet company. I have to add that now. Yeah, it's that's the thing. It's on our logo and everything. <laughs> I saw <laughs> And I will insert the longer form introduction right here. Okay. Welcome to Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propelix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propelix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propelix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propelix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts app design development and support. Additionally, Propelix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. There we go. There it is. <laughs> uh, so I'm here in the Anexanet studio, which is a legitimate podcast studio, unlike the barn uh, where where I pretend to uh, host a <laughs> podcast. We're talking into very fancy uh, microphones uh, with the whole desk clips, and uh, we've got real monitors and there are headphones and all sorts of equipment everywhere. Yeah, it's uh, we went legit at some point. I I was very surprised because it started off as a joke. I'm not gonna lie. Like, yeah, we talked about the studio. And I was like, yeah, the studio. Like it was just a joke, haha. And then um, one of our marketing people was like, no, seriously, we can set up the studio. I'm like, okay. Sure we can. And next thing I knew, they were like, okay, this is the room it's going to be in, and we need to get a couch. And I was like, why do we need a couch? What are we going to be doing in this room? The couches yeah. are very important. There is a black leather couch for it's, reasons completely unknown. It's really me. nice. You want to be very comfortable when you're recording your podcast. I also noticed that you have an on-air sign. That I'm especially jealous of. Yeah, that was uh, that was the brainchild of uh, the, the marketing person. Um, they are like, you need an on-air sign. And then she meticulously picked out exactly which it's one. It's gorgeous. It's really it's nice. It's like Art Deco. It is, and it takes a special uh, special order light bulb, which I found out when it burned out the first time, and we didn't have any light bulb that would fit it. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought a three-pack, so we're good for a little bit. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, where I just have to uh, – what I what my on-air sign consists of me doing this. Like, and I'm waving, waving your hands. my hands frantically in the air. <laughs> and that's whenever I see, like, my wife walk by or the kids or something. That's the signal. Mm. Do not come in. Yeah, so you have to record at home? Yeah. Well, we have a little separate barn, so I'm able okay. to record in there. But there, it's but the yard's right there, and the kids are always screaming and playing. So what I did, uh, my, my uh, strategy for dealing with that is I incorporate them into the podcast whenever I Well, there you I go. Can. Just make it on purpose, right? Yeah, it's totally <laughs> intentional. We have four chickens now. Okay. And they've been on the podcast a few times, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I was eating chicken and the, why that made – why it was was had any significance at all that I was eating chicken in that last episode. I got gotcha. you. Because we have chickens, you have chickens. So. Now, the chickens that you have, those I'm are not, primarily was, for egg laying, I assume? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't okay. eating one of those chickens. Yeah, our neighbors – my neighbors, like, across the street – have six chickens, I think, in a coop in like their backyard, 
And there's a couple other people in my neighborhood that all have chickens. It's a big, very popular thing to have now. Yeah, very which trendy. When I when we moved in, they came over and they were like, "Hi, welcome to the neighborhood. Here's a dozen fresh eggs and <laughs> right. some muffins that we baked with fresh <laughs> eggs." And I was like, "Where am I? What is going <laughs> right. on?" Like I moved from a pretty packed uh, not urban, but like barely suburban area to you know more of a, a, a pastoral setting, and they're like, "Here, fresh eggs." I was like, "Ah, That's I've amazing. made it to the land of milk and honey." Are you nearby? Uh, not too yeah. like uh, forty minutes yeah. from here. So, so yeah, but I mean, north and into like sort of the country right. hinterlands. Yeah. So yeah, it's really pretty. Well, so um, I'm up in Boston, but my family is like ready to move down. To Philly, you don't like, sound like you're from moments Boston. Notice, no, I grew up in Lexington. That's okay, <laughs> people, anybody from Lexington will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Other people will be like, I don't understand why he doesn't. I can put it on if you want. Would that help? What the Boston the, accent yeah. or the Kentucky accent? The Boston Could... accent. Oh, uh, Lexington, Massachusetts. Oh, Lexington, Massachusetts. Okay, yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah. Now, Would that I... help? You want me to talk? Like, no, it's it's a quite. Mark I mean, or... I, I can lay on the Philly accent, but. <laughs> We're, we're trying to keep it uh, American neutral, I think. Is that? Yeah. What, I don't okay. know what the technical voice is for that. Yeah. Lexington, Mass. Midwest. Okay. Midwest. That's is the that Midwest. What? Although that's – anyway. All right. Uh, <laughs> so did I – I thought I had a point. Uh, maybe. It's so not, It's not important. <laughs> so, S- Steve, yeah. um, my first question for you is – What am I doing here? Who are you and what would you say you do around here? Yeah. So um, what I do for Propellix, I, I, I sort of wear a lot of hats. I'm a UX guy. I'm a mobile strategist. Uh, I'm a writer. So I do all the copy, editing, uh, whatever, anything that um, goes out on the site or uh, in emails or in marketing materials comes through me okay. first. Um, a lot of our team is down in Guadalajara. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of essential that somebody looks at it. So um, that's me. And that's what I'm going to be doing for you guys primarily. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of the marketing, taking over a lot of that stuff. Okay. And and a lot of the, the copy editing. And um, so I, 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 don't know what, I don't know what the plan is around the podcasts. If we're just we're, – Propellix and the Next and Next Company is going to be – is going to stick around for at, at least the next 12 months. And then I don't know. We're all going to be like assimilated into the the, the Borg. I, yeah, I actually don't know what the plan is for long term assimilation, yeah. and we're probably not even allowed to speculate on that. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's cool. So, um, is your background from the UX and like design side, and then you fell into like the copy editing as a, just a consequence of being in the in at Propellix? Kind of some of each. Um, I sort of got started in technology when. I, I mean, I have an MFA in fiction, okay. and then I went out to L.A. to try to get a job in comedy, and I wound up working for a National Lampoon for, like, a bunch of years. I've, I've heard of them. Yeah, <laughs> people have heard of them. People tend to dislike them at this point, but we, we tried to be funny. Uh, but we, were do, we built a website for the Lampoon. Okay. Um, and so that's how I got into more into technology, but I already had some tech background. So uh, just kept it going, and then just it turned into, like, UX, mm-hmm. uh, which wasn't even really a field back then. Right. That is a field that did not exist 10 years did ago. Did not exist. So I got lucky I did not have to go to school for it. Mm-hmm. I went to the school of hard knocks. <laughs> hard UX? Yeah. The, I learned my UX on the street. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, baseball bats and... Banners I don't have and... a degree. I don't need a piece of paper <laughs> to tell me that I can tell you how to design your website or your mobile app. See, UX design to me is like magic because I am not good at that at all. Like if you need someone to like script something out or maybe do a little code editing, like I'm, I, I can do that. I'm there. If you need someone to like organize something and make it look pretty, definitely talk to somebody else. Cause... Well, okay. Here's where developers make the mistake every time, that developers are thinking too much. That's the problem. I will let all the developers know to stop thinking. This is a great subject <laughs> for this podcast, where I think okay. we're on to something here. Okay. So, because the key with UX is to just um, 
just imagine that the dumbest person in the world is using your product. Okay. So, uh, and then just design for that that dumb person. Uh, so assume that if there's something that can go wrong or could be misinterpreted, that it will be misinterpreted. Right. So everything has to be as simple and as clear as possible. That's interesting because when you're writing code or scripts – you always have to validate the input and validate the output and assume that something is going to go wrong. And a UX design sounds you know, very similar, eerily yeah. similar in that yeah. regard. Yeah. Trust but verify. <laughs> Sometimes what I'll do, uh, if I want to really verify something, if I'm like um, testing an app that one of the other designers has, has built or a prototype or something, I will literally get drunk and then try to use the app. And that's the test. Can I use the app when I'm drunk? And if I can use it successfully, then I know that the UX is okay. See, I would. My thought would immediately is like, give it to my six year old, and if he oh, can, they... if he can use it, no. But you know, he's probably more no, advanced exactly. than some of the worst users. Exactly. That's so. That maybe that's wrong ne- approach. maybe that's. I d- maybe what I should really do is hand it to, to your dad, my dad, yeah. and be like, "Can you navigate this?" That's right. Because uh, that's. Unsurprisingly, he switched from Android to iPhone about two years ago oh, no. because he found Android too frustrating to understand. Oh, if he's frustrated with Android. I don't think that iPhone is any easier to use than You know, than, but uh, the big Android difference there is that they had the Genius Bar and the sessions at the Apple Store oh, that yeah. he went to, and they, like, showed him how to do things. Yeah. So maybe that wasn't as much UX as the fact that they just have someone who will hold your hand yeah. through everything. Yeah. And, like, that would have been me otherwise, so... Thank you, Apple, for that. Yeah, we are definitely all uh, cursed with being tech support for our parents. That's something we all have in common. Extended family, really. Yeah. Anytime there's yeah. a family gathering, yeah. every, someone will corner me and be like, you're a computer guy. I'm having trouble with my, like, DVD player. And I'm like, um, yeah. sure. Let's go. <laughs> for me, it's always printer issues. My, It's constant with my dad having printer issues. Yeah. He cannot... Remember how to cut and paste. Mm. That's that's his level of okay. uh, savviness. Wow. Can't remember how to do it every time. I must have shown him at least a dozen times, literally, how to cut and paste on mm-hmm. the screen on a, on a laptop. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. it seems like he would be a good tester for UX. <laughs> he would be great. But he has a flip phone, and he's not <laughs> switching it around. I, I got gotcha. you. So I think yeah. it's probably a balance, though, because, like, you don't want the UX – um, you don't want to not be able to support your more advanced users, but you also want right. the most basic of users be able to accomplish what, whatever their goal is. Right. Well, no, no user would ever complain about simplicity. That's the thing. The other thing is consistency is really important. Okay. That's the other thing we see a lot, uh, lack of consistency from one – from you know desktop to mobile. I know. Like, so I used to I – I cut my teeth in IT doing help desk. And so help desk is where you get all the people who can't figure something out. Even though it's blindingly obvious, you get calls. So working first-tier help desk taught me to not assume anything when someone calls in. Because I literally had stuff like, okay, I need you to restart the computer. Can you turn it off and back on? Sure. And I'd hear them, like, push the button and then be like, okay, it's back on. And only, like, three seconds had passed. And I'd be like... Did you push the button on the screen or on the tower? Because most of them would just turn off the screen and be like, oh, I restarted the computer. Right. No, you didn't. Right. Or is it plugged in was a <laughs> a question that I asked so many times and trying to describe to them the correct cable. I mean, fortunately, like, everything's USB now, so it's like, okay, just make sure all your USBs. But back then it was like you had a serial cable and a PS2 cable and you had the power cable and, like, maybe a modem cable. It was like... So many different cables and yeah. trying to describe to them what connector was what. Wow. Yeah, yeah so that's like that bad been terrible. Uh, in, in real life UX design. Yeah. The back of a computer was like uh, a horrifying mystery for most yeah. people. I remember the SCSI connector. Oh, God. I remember those The 72 days. pin SCSI? Yeah. Yeah, I was excited <laughs> when they went down to mini SCSI. That was, yeah. that was like a big deal. Yeah. And you had to chain them. And I, I go far back enough that I remember having to manually assign SCSI numbers to the devices. Yeah. It had, like, each one had a little uh, incrementer on it, and it was zero through seven. And you could have more than eight devices on a SCSI chain. Yeah. Oh, God, wow. Now, 
Uh, wow, we're going back a ways. We really are. So, it's getting nostalgic on the yeah, Device Squad I, and Exonet. I feel like we should podcast be, from like propellers. drinking some beers and uh, and just talking about the good old days. Yeah. So they weren't that good. <laughs> no, they were lousy. <laughs> they were lousy. Um, so the other thing about UX that I want to mention is um, I think that. I mean, the, if you think about the evolution of software, I remember back in, like, the 90s and so forth, there was just sort of this attitude of where, like, the more features, the better. And right. nobody really worried about the layout or the UX at all. And now we're at a point where, especially with, I think, mobile kind of led this charge of simplicity because it it insisted on simplicity. It requires, right. you've got this tiny screen, so you really have to be focused on, like, a single task at a time. Um, so there's so much more attention that needs to be paid towards the organization of the interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And And the funny thing is that uh, I feel like there was – it's almost like um, – it works this way with language, too. And somebody will use highfalutin language. Um, they do it because they think that it sounds impressive, you know, so it's kind of the same way with software. If there's more features and so forth, and it looks complex, the the, the thinking was that that's going to be somehow more impressive. And the funny thing is that language works the same way in from a UX perspective. Uh, language, uh, say, like um, the language of buttons, the language of uh, instructive copy, you know, the language of alerts, anything mm-hmm. like that, it all has to be very uh, simple, uh, common language. Right. You know, you want it to be as easy for the user to understand as possible. It's a very simple premise. And so it's the same way with the interactions. They just need to be simple. So that's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> right. I, that language thing sort of triggers something with me because um... – you know, I, I got my degree in computer science, but I had to take a number of, like, creative writing. And, well, I didn't have to, but I chose to because I liked that stuff. Um, and some writing analysis and film analysis. And in some cases, people really just use big words to use big words. Right. Um, whether or not they actually move your point forward or make anything clear. I think you can use highfalutin language in a precise way to convey a complex uh, thought in a more nuanced way. But that takes a measure of, like, self-editing and, and knowing that it, this is exactly what the word means and I, I'm intending to say it and I'm trying to convey this really complex idea to you. So I have to use this terminology. Yeah. But sometimes I would read, like, some texts and it became painfully obvious that the author was just using as many big words as they could possibly fit in. And it didn't make their point any more um, poignant if you will, yeah, uh, it just muddied everything and made it really hard to like parse what they were saying. Right, that's exactly right. And the same way, an interface gets muddied by by too much interaction. Right, and there's you know I, I'm not there, I have no argument that the that there are certainly great words mm-hmm. that are big words that are amazing words and right. should be used. <laughs> but you know when you're talking about uh, software, there's rarely any call for a, a large word like that describes yeah. a complex concept. I, I find a few, but they're mostly uh, in the vein of programming where you're trying to yeah. s- describe a programming concept, but that's not something that really the end user ever sees. Right. Uh, that's like, so if, we're, if I'm trying to talk about immutable concepts or um, what's the other one that I run into uh, a lot? There's There's a lot of big terms out there, but they're all really reserved for the programmers talking to each other, not you talking to the end user. Exactly. So I've been brought on. Um, I've I've been tasked with uh, rewriting a lot of the Indexinet copy on the website and so forth to try to bring it more uh, down to earth and and try to describe Indexinet services in some more more common language and things like that, which is. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in a lot of cases, uh, and I know because I wrote some of it, um, but some of it was written by our engineers, and yeah. they have trouble distilling down their thought from where they're coming from in a very technical way, explain that to someone who's more of a lay person. And I think it really takes someone who's completely outside of it, like you, 
to come in and go, I'm the okay, drunk. that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Explain to me like I'm a five-year-old. Right, exactly. And or keep exp- my dad. Or your dad. And yeah. keep explaining it to me in simpler and more clear terms until it makes sense. Right. That's good. I That sounds good to yeah, me. Yeah, because most uh, – most, <laughs> Most of your clients and most of Propelix and the Nexonet company's clients are like on the business side, and they don't understand that stuff. Right. And in fact, what we were, we uh, on our blog, our blog started out being fairly technical, mm-hmm. and the feedback we got was that it was too technical. So we just kept sort of broadening the scope of, okay. of the topics, and the same thing. That's why our podcast, uh, Device Squad, never gets super technical. I keep it. I'd rather. Talk about subjects that everybody's interested in, like Bitcoin or like tools for autism and things like that. Right. Keep it somewhat conceptual. Yeah. Yeah. I I will say, so it's true that a NextNet's client base, uh, a large portion of it is the business side, but I would say it's probably 50-50 between business mm-hmm. and like I, traditional IT operations. Yeah. So for those folks, we can get a little more down in the weeds about things. And that's so portions of the podcast, especially the next pod, sometimes I'll dive, do a deep dive down something, but that's clearly called out in the title. So if you want to skip that episode because you don't care about storage spaces, direct and Windows Server, nice. totally cool. Yeah. Skip that one. But then we have a whole other one that's just talking about new patterns for designing infrastructure. That one stays a little more high level. You don't need to know a, a whole lot uh, of the nitty gritty details to understand the higher level concepts that are behind it. Right. But yeah, I do sometimes struggle like getting a high enough concept because I spend so much time down in the weeds, you know? Right. Interesting. Yeah. So I got to elevate that a little bit. So you're a developer. No. Oh, I'm not. So a what is your title? Let's <laughs> let me interview you for a little bit. Okay. Sure. So. Uh, so my, Official title is Director of Cloud Solutions. Okay. I would say that I am kind of a combination, uh, well, I, I like a product manager, uh-huh. more or less. So all the things that go in that, like the sales enablement, development of solutions, doing some pre-sales work, doing some marketing work, helping write copy. Like, you know, a product manager has to wear about 12 different hats. Yeah. Um, so even though I have a director title, I don't direct anybody but myself, and I'm basically a product manager. But we didn't have that as a thing. Right. Prior to me, so <laughs> I think internally we're called solution leaders, which mm-hmm. again really doesn't capture the breadth and scope of what we're responsible for. But really, I'm responsible for helping accelerate our cloud practice, and that is mostly on the uh, cloud infrastructure and um, software as a service side of things. Um, we do have you know the whole separate app development team, and I work with them when there's an opportunity to create a cloud-native application so I can help advise them or help in the pre-sales process to talk to the infrastructure side of things. But one of my counterparts, Dan Kelly, is really good on doing the pre-sales for cloud-native applications. So the two of us might tag-team a pre-sales opportunity because between the two of us, we've got all the knowledge to cover the full stack. So he he can go into, like, the code and how you might architect an application using some native services on AWS or something. And then I can go, okay, to support that, you're going to need this infrastructure. You're going to need to be able to back it up, to monitor it appropriately, to secure it for compliance. And here's all how all those things are going to work. So between the two of us, wow. we can get something together, right? Um, my background is, like I said, I started on help desk. Yeah. And then moved up to like a desktop admin. So okay. I was helping like deploy desktops, troubleshoot desktops, uh, and then slowly started creeping into, you know, standing up and configuring server-grade applications and managing domain controllers and exchange servers and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then just kept moving up in that realm to becoming a real systems administrator. Uh, and then at a certain point, I kind of hit a ceiling on that and moved over into the consulting world because I wanted to keep work, keep working with whatever was new and interesting the problem was most companies have that sort of like three-year buying cycle. So everything's boring. Not boring, but everything's the same for about three years until you yeah. get to buy that one new shiny thing. And then you have that new shiny thing and you get to play with it for six months. And then that becomes the old boring thing and you have to wait another, you know, however long for the next shiny thing. Right. 
when you work in consulting, you're working with the new shiny thing all the time. All the time. Which is yeah. both exciting and somewhat exhausting at times. Exactly. It's really <laughs> – it's <laughs> it's the same. We um, – so we uh, build – Enterprise apps for large enterprises primarily, and we do a lot of, like, prototyping. Um, Our initial engagement will involve uh, strategy, ideation, and wireframing and prototyping, and we do it all in, like, two weeks. That's kind of like our claim to fame. We can, like, we'll give you a prototype in two weeks. Um, And that that alone is pretty exhausting. But then Mm -hmm. when on top of that, you need to keep up with all the advancements of the latest iOS or Android OS and then all the the latest usability modalities or, you know, whatever the newest thing is. Like right now it's like sort of uh, animating the UI so that things come in. You know, everything can be on one screen, and elements just sort of move around as you interact with them. So they sort of hide and sh- show and hide. Right. You know, which makes sense. It's great. But, uh, you know, so what's next? I don't know what's next, but we'll see, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to learn it. So, Yeah. That's, so that's just, from a UX perspective, you have to see what, what's trending and what's right. actually useful versus what's just a, a fad. Right. And then sort of figure out what makes sense for your enterprise customers. Right. Yeah. Uh, Skeuomorphism was a fad. That is that, was. So I think I know what that that's means. That's a big word. But <laughs> let me just try it. So is that yeah. when something in the UI uh, mimics a real world item? Right. Like if exactly. it's a notepad, it'll look like a legal rule notepad. Right. So yeah. Apple was really big on that for a while. Huge. Yeah. Huge. That was kind of like their big differentiator at first. Like mm-hmm. things look like they were made out of wood or metal or like <laughs> right. and now and then Android actually kind of beat them to the flat design. And then uh Apple kind of followed suit and it made sense because really the device is the interaction, you know. Right. The medium is the message basically. So why are we trying to make it look like other things? Um, and that made sense, but now we're kind of going back a little bit. Now that with the, all the animation, mm-hmm. um, there's design is kind of coming back a little more. Uh, you'll see more colors and shadows and things like that. That where sort of, because menus need to be differentiated from other menus a little more. Um, so it kind of ebbs and flows. Right, you know? it's the pendulum. It's right, fa- it's a real fashion. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That that's the same in all technologies I find. So, um, you know, for a, a while the pendulum in I in infrastructure swings from everything being disaggregated and decentralized to everything being highly centralized and high, highly aggregated and then it swings back. So, like way back we had mainframes and everything was yeah. highly centralized. Yeah. Yeah. And then the PC revolution hit and everything became kind of decentralized to a certain degree. Uh, and then we kind of went through another centralization um, when they started doing VDI deployments. So all the data and the processing went back to live up in your data centers, and you just had like kind of a dumb terminal or a mobile device that was just giving you a screen into what was running in the data center. Yeah. And now I feel like we're headed back into that decentralization where more of the software is actually running on the end devices because dealing with that latency is uh, is no good for at least consumer grade stuff like more than it was like 500 milliseconds of latency is enough to make a user abandon an app yeah users are they have no patience at all no they, brutal no tolerance they're not gonna it's like that old louis ck bit where he says like everything's amazing and nobody's happy you know? like, <laughs> but, but like, it could be more amazing yeah i get it you know, you, people are complaining about a technology that they just learned existed 10 minutes ago. You yeah. Know? and But they have an idea of how it should function. Or any minor inconvenience yeah. is enough of an excuse to talk about why it stinks, right? right. Um, but what about the cloud? Does the cloud count as, like, a, like a mainframe kind of Yeah, so that was sort of the centralization that started to happen was um, – it, when we had all had our mill servers and, and various applications deployed in our little data centers, and we were all kind of happy about it, but it was a lot of management. And then the cloud did this thing where it kind of offered SaaS, software as a service, yeah. and now sucked all that stuff up into their big cloud data centers, which is great uh, from a management standpoint. But now I need a way to have 
real-time interaction with mm-hmm. those services. So my devices, my laptop, my desktop, my mobile device has to be able to run that stuff locally to a certain degree. And then you also have all the IoT stuff happening. So all of these edge devices that need to be closer to an endpoint to collect information, so like a self-driving car, that thing has, I don't even know how many sensors on it, and it needs to make real-time decisions based off of information that's streaming in from those sensors. It can't send something up to the cloud and wait. Right. It course. has to make a split-second decision. Is that a person or a deer? Do I have to stop? Like, what's going on in this intersection? And, I mean, most of those cars have, like, a fail- their fail-safe is to just stop and wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, for obvious reasons. But it yeah. really does need to be able to process all that stuff locally. So you're seeing sort of a kind of a decentralization of information and processing. Um, and also, as the, uh, the global uh, footprint of digital expands, because right now, was it like 2 billion people have internet and mobile to a certain degree? There's still another, what, like uh, 5 billion people on the planet. Yeah. When those people start getting wired in or wireless wirelessly hooked into the ecosystem, it's probably going to be on a mobile device. And you're going to need to put an endpoint close enough to them that they're actually getting some performance out of that. They Mm -hmm. can't send stuff back to the U.S. when they're sitting somewhere in Uganda waiting for a response from a web server. You need something that's like like some sort of endpoint that's much closer to them to be able to process that information. Wasn't Zuckerberg going to take care of that? Didn't he have a plan to put (sighs) servers on uh, hot air balloons or... Uh, satellite so Google really? had a project called Project Loon, yeah, and that was putting um, network devices on, on hot air balloons. Oh, okay. So it was like weather balloons, basically, yeah. uh, and with like I guess some motors to them, so they could kind of place themselves appropriately. Zuckerberg was talking about like low Earth orbit satellites or like gliders that would stay really high up, but that solves the providing them with wireless service. But it doesn't actually solve the problem of getting the content closer to them. And that's why we have stuff like Akamai and other Mm -hmm. CDNs that put the most commonly accessed data closer to the user. But uh, I know, like, all of those services are getting better and better at putting dynamic content closer to the user. Because right now, like, a lot of them just do static content. So, you know, the images on a website will all be cached locally. But if something's dynamically generated, like a – a form or a complex UI like you were talking about, like that has to be rendered back at the server farm and then sent across the wire. That takes too long. So instead you see the rise of stuff like Node.js where it just sends you the JavaScript and, and the uh, the content and then it's rendered locally on the mm-hmm. device. So that's that's another like swing of centralization, decentralization uh, through JavaScript. So so what are we seeing now for cloud uses? Is it like primarily for like a backup so that there's just a redundancy of data? And, I see know. a couple trends. Um, startups tend to go all in on cloud and not yeah. have a local data center. They might have like something in their office that you know handles file and print or maybe just print. But uh, everything else is running in the cloud through a SaaS if possible, through infrastructure as a service if you must. Sort of. So, like, SaaS is always going to be cheaper if you can use that and less work for your admins to deal with or your ops people. Um, but sometimes you do need some sort of infrastructure. So that's where, like, AWS and Azure kick in. For enterprises, usually they dip their toe in because a developer swiped a credit card and started deploying stuff in AWS. And then the enterprise finds out and they're like, oh, well, okay, well, I guess we're already there. We should put some other stuff up there. Um, so they're slowly deciding whether or not being in the data center business has anything to do with their core capabilities. And the answer more often than not is no. Running a data center is not core to our business. You know, if you're, uh, I don't know, if you're a dress, uh, a carpet cleaning service, running data centers is not core to your business of cleaning carpets. So why have a data center or a server closet and an IT guy who manages all that hardware? It probably doesn't make sense. So, you know, use SaaS where you can, infrastructure if you must, and innovate around your core competency of being really good at cleaning carpets and not being able to back up servers in your uh, little data closet. Right. I had one episode about Amazon Lambda. Ooh, Lambda's cool. Yeah. (laughs) Serverless. Yeah. 
It's amazing. Which unbelievable. I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that engineers are pedantic. Um, horribly so. <laughs> so the first thing they say I is, well, so. there's servers somewhere. And it's like, yes, right. we know. Right. Everybody move on. It wasn't a great name, but it's what we have. Right. And it's right. called it's serverless. serverless. Right. Uh, but, I mean, no, that's – serverless is really cool. It allows for very interesting application design patterns. It doesn't fit in well to um, old school enterprise applications. So your ERP system is not ready to go serverless. Uh, okay. Um, your CRM system, well, you might be using SaaS for that, like Salesforce or something. Um, but like your manufacturing system is not ready to go serverless because you bought it from a vendor and they did a very traditional like three tier app. Uh, and it's not, it's barely even ready to be virtualized, let alone moved into a cloud native thing. Right. So that's, sure. that's kind of what we're dealing with is we've got these enterprises that have these applications that were written 20 years ago with that paradigm in mind. Yeah. And now they want to modernize that, and there's no easy way to do it. So, like, the least painful way that we've seen is if you have to get to the cloud, let's do a lift and shift, meaning we'll just clone your VMs, basically, and move them to infrastructure as a service in Azure AWS. Okay, boom, you're in the cloud now. Now, if you want, and you have the in-house development skill to do it, you can start peeling back layers of that application and putting them into cloud-native services. So maybe you have um, a reporting element to your application. Doesn't make, and it's using SQL reporting services. Maybe there's a better reporting platform. Maybe you could use Power BI to do all your reporting. So let's look at stripping that app, that portion of the application out and using software as a service instead. Sure. But now that you have it up in the cloud, at least you ha- it's really close to those other services, and the integration is easier. Sure. So let me just backtrack a little bit. Okay. How did you get into the podcasting business, so to speak? Now, you have a great, you have a great voice for radio. Well, thank you. Sir. Is that just, <laughs> That's just coincidental? Luck. Or? <laughs> it's pure luck. <laughs> um, so, and I, I would ask you the same question, but I will answer since you asked me first. Uh, I got into podcasting, what year is it? About 12 years ago, I found out about this podcast mm-hmm. thing because um, I was just looking for interesting things to listen to, and I came across Podio Books. I don't know if you remember this. This is no. going way back. Is that an app? What is that? It was a website where people were recording their audio books, like authors oh. would record their book as an audiobook and publish it in serial fashion as a podcast. Oh. So I discovered that and I discovered there was another one and um, I can't even remember the name of it now. There was like a, a sci-fi podcast that was covering all, some of the sci-fi stuff I was watching at the time. So I was like, ooh, I think it was called This Week in Sci-Fi. It was like very straightforward. Um, so I was like, oh, podcasting is a thing. This is really interesting. People are telling stories. I really like music. I should start a music podcast where I will play, you know, five or six songs every week, talk about what's going on in the music world a little bit, at least the music that I listen to, and maybe someday I'll interview somebody. So I I got all the gear. I started up the podcast. I had a website, the whole nine yards. I think I got about 12 episodes in, and then I pod faded. You pod faded? I pod faded. I've never heard that term before. Is that that the... The burnout that happened? Yes. So <laughs> most podcasts don't make it past, like, episode four. Oh, yeah. So I made it a little further than that, but, um, like, life happened. Yeah. And podcasting wasn't kid. at the top of my priority list. Is that what happened? Uh, no. No, but I met my future wife. Oh, yeah. So suddenly I had a lot less free time because we were in the sure. courtship uh, yeah. portion of things. So I stopped doing the podcast, but I always had in the back of my mind, that was a lot of fun. I'd like to do that again. Um, once I had been in NextNet for a few years, I started thinking, you know what would be really cool? If a NextNet had a podcast to talk about all the awesome stuff we do and all the awesome stuff going on in the tech world, I'm going to start that. So I just walked, I just literally grabbed the mic and told the marketing group, I'm like, I'm going to start a podcast. It's going to be called Nextapod. Let's do this. And they're like, but we don't even know how to set up. Where do you want to post it? And I was like, we'll figure it out. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. That's essentially what happened to me with Propelix. Yeah. Um, since I'm doing a lot of uh, marketing, um, it just occurred to me, like, well, why don't we do a podcast? I mean, mm-hmm. we have the blog. We have webinars. We have white papers. We have all these things. Podcast just makes sense. Right. You know, it's fairly easy to do. And 
it's one uh, more like channel one more for channel. you to for you to broadcast your message yeah. on, basically. Yeah, and I had some experience just production wise with editing and so forth, and that all that again goes back to the lampoon because since it was a website we were producing video and audio content we were sure. like working in like flash and real player and like mm, flash <laughs> yeah remember those oh uh, i spent some time in the trenches with flash yeah i so because i was involved in music uh pre like facebook myspace yeah you had to design websites for bands and mm-hmm. if they wanted music to play on their website the easiest way was to build a music player in flash yeah, but then all of them wanted that. it skinned for the site or for the band. So I spent a lot of time in FLA files. Oh yeah, uh, and, and doing action scripts. Oh yeah, which was awful to debug. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's nice that that's sort of all done now. <laughs> yeah, but so are you a musician also? Uh, I I was in several bands as a front person, so that was, I think that all kind of feeds back into it too. Like I'm comfortable in front of people yeah. and and being like the voice of something. Yeah. So that I think that fed back into it as well. Because I'm, I'm a drummer, so I'm in, in bands as a back person. Okay. And I'm a comedian, so that's why I'm comfortable in front of a microphone. Okay, so have you done stand-up? Yeah, I've been doing stand-up forever. Wow, so, really? Yeah. I have heard that um, the first few times, well, actually not just the first time, but the first like year of stand-up, you're going to bomb like constantly, and you just have to develop a thick skin around that and just understand that you will get better eventually. Well, it depends. I mean, unless you're a guy like Stephen Wright and you have a new, a really new delivery Mm -hmm. or, you know, or uh, somebody like Sam Kinison or or Rodney Dangerfield, somebody like that, where what they're doing is so innovative. Because I don't think those guys really had, like, a break-in period. But if you're, you know, an average kind of joke comedian, yeah, that's pretty much true. Um, because you kind of, like, spend the first year kind of learning to get out of your own way. Okay. You become a different person on stage, and you think that you need to... It's kind of hard to articulate. But, um, like, ideally... and. Woody Allen said this, uh, that uh, a, an audience really just wants to like you. They want If you're likable, then that's half the battle right there. Okay. It's not so much about the material as it is about you being likable as a person. So when you go out there and you're just beginning, you think, God, this material has to be brilliant or it's just not going to go over. But that doesn't happen. Like You can have the best material, but you go out and you're just not likable because maybe you've come across as being, like, arrogant or pretentious or whatever, and the audience just decides they don't like you. Right. The material can be genius, but you're not going to get any laughs because they're not no longer on your side. Right. You know? So I, I always thought that when you go to a comedy club, you want to laugh. Like, you're there to Sometimes. laugh. Sometimes. I, I, it depends where you are. If I was going to a comedy club... I, I'm going there with the intention to laugh. So I want you to get up on stage and tell jokes. I'm rooting for you. I'm like, yeah, I want you to make me laugh because that's why I'm here. I imagine not everybody's You're like that. You're very but... nice. You'd be a great audience. To, okay. To, but like <laughs> Boston audiences are like notoriously brutal. Okay. You know, they're super um, uh, critical, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's th- which is part of the fun because – uh, Boston and specifically like Cambridge audiences want a comedian that's like super smart, super like um, progressive. That's the other thing. That's a whole other podcast topic. The idea, of, <laughs> the idea of where comedy's going, where stand up's going. Mm. Um, but if you're just going, to, you know, if you're just like, let's say in the Midwest, <laughs> I'm going to say because they're so nice out there. Then yeah, I think that effect where people are just there because they want to laugh and they want to have a good time i think that would probably be a bigger a bigger factor right uh in in a comedian's success so obviously being on stage has given you you a certain level of confidence of just speaking in front of people and being comfortable in front of a mic yeah so obviously that helps with podcasting yeah i think so and 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 just um being comfortable with winging it you know yeah um I, I do. I know that the first few times that I did podcasts for an Xnet, like I had everything scripted. Like yeah, the me too. entire podcast was written out, and it took me like days to prepare a podcast. 
And now, I mean, I I come up with a list of questions for the guest because I want to have something there. Yeah. But I also feel comfortable letting the conversation just go wherever it's going to. And if we never get back to that list of questions, but it was interesting and informative, that's fine. That's all I need. That's pretty much exactly the journey that I've had. If yeah. I go back and listen to the first couple episodes, I don't want to. I would, no, no, it's I painful. painful. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Because um, I think I did the same thing. I think I, like, scripted everything out. And um, and now, and we have a, I will, do you do a lot of interviews internally with your own guys? It, it's it's a split. So I try to do about half internal and half external. Yeah. Um, so people feel like they're getting to know an XNet, but it doesn't feel like it's just all marketing about an XNet. I want them to also get like real value through the podcast. Yeah. Because I try to do that too. And a couple of the strategists will still write out their answers mm-hmm. and then read them. So. I did one that was... Um, it was the DevOps podcast, and the two guys that we had internally. One was pretty comfortable. He is in a band. He's like a singer, bass player for a band. So, like, being in front of Mike in front of an audience is not a big deal to him. But the other guy, very introverted, mm-hmm. not comfortable in front of the mic at all. He had written out everything he wanted to say, and he sounded like a robot that was just reading a script. Sure. And I was like, dude, yeah. just loosen up a little bit. And yeah. just no matter what I did to try to shake him loose, he was still just. Ugh, like on the rail and don't don't ask me to get off the rail and it's like okay fine you know you do your thing and you know we'll try to spice it up between the dialogue of the other two of us a little bit that's exactly what i did i brought in other strategists i said you know what instead <laughs> of just doing let's just bring in some we'll make it a forum right and we'll bring in the other guys who are just gonna horse around <laughs> yeah yeah because you need that level of, of levity people yeah. don't people don't want a textbook read to them but I, it, I, maybe it's a really funny textbook. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I did make sure to get back to what the strategist had written out and to make right. sure to get back to his questions and let him get everything out because he had a lot of valuable things to say. Yeah. It's just elaborating on those points a little bit on the fly to make it still feel like it's a conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, I, my favorite podcast, and I don't know if you listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I listen to entirely too many probably. Yeah. Um, my favorite podcasts are generally the ones where it feels like you're just eavesdropping on a really interesting conversation. Yeah, like uh, Pod Save America, I would say, is one that's like that. Okay, let me put that on the list of podcasts. Oh, yeah, that's um, – <laughs> um, oh, what's the dude's name on Pod Save America? Shoot. Is that uh, the old MTV VJ? It's the guy that used that – that he's a scriptwriter for Obama. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know this one at all. I don't okay. think he is anymore. Uh, I'm gonna look it up. Is it? Am I allowed to Google things? Uh, you can Google whatever you want, um, or you can Bing it. Not that anybody actually does that, but yeah. oh, Bing it. Bing. Yeah, how is, is Bing still? How are they still around? I don't. Uh, Bing is still how a does that thing. Work? Uh, I don't know anybody who actively uses yeah. it that doesn't work for Microsoft. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I attend a lot of Microsoft type events. And, you know, five years ago, if you had come into, if someone from Microsoft had brought a Mac to a presentation, like, they would be taken out in the hallway and talked to. Like, that would, now, like, most of the presenters I saw at the last Microsoft event were using, were running either Linux or Mac Mm. for their desktop OS. And they were Mm -hmm. using open source tools. Um, But the one thing that they still do is they still use Bing if they have to search something because I guess like the Bing search to. team has not gotten the message and they're just like no you have to use Bing That's if you're doing funny. a presentation so they're like and we're going to Bing it <laughs> <laughs> it was like okay like wait what oh <laughs> that. right that's still a thing <laughs> yeah I think Bing has a lot of power behind it in terms of its capabilities to be a search engine yeah but I think it has a, a, the only future it has is a, something like how Foursquare moved from Foursquare was a front-end app that people used for a certain period of time, and then they moved into being sort of a, a back-end for a lot of other apps. So they provide back-end services for location data and ratings and all that kind of stuff, but they're not front-facing to the client anymore. And I could see Bing powering other things with its search technology sure. without yeah. actually being a front-facing app that people use. Yeah. I did not know that about Foursquare. That's very interesting. 
Are you uh, are you the mayor of anything? I remember, the mayor right? wasn't that their thing? Wasn't that their big thing? Wasn't uh, Foursquare the app where oh you God, check yeah, in? They were, I barely and, used it. Yeah, like, I just wasn't real big on that. If whole you like thing. check in a certain amount of times, then you become the mayor. Yeah, that remember was definitely that? their thing. Yeah, that was really. Now, right, now so, they just power like. I think, like, Grubhub uses them on the back end and, like, a whole bunch of other ones. Oh, that was smart. Um, the only reason I know that is because I listened to the A16Z podcast. <laughs> and that was, like, one of the, the one of the roundtables they did was about, like, location services oh, and okay. the future of how that works with apps and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys from Foursquare was there. And I was like, oh, I thought they weren't a company anymore. And he's like, no, we're actually extremely profitable. <laughs> you just don't see us anymore. Right. So Pod Save America is John Favreau, who was – the script writer for John Obama. Favreau, John Favreau, not the director of no, Iron Man. Favreau. No. Uh, and John Lovett. Those are t- the two main guys. And I think this guy Favreau is actually from my town, Winchester. Oh, okay. Uh, Look at that. Strangely enough. And um, so I listened to that one, and I listened to uh, Radio Lab, which is just amazing. Oh, I love Radio Lab. But a very different thing, not – the same of just guys hanging out. In it a can be a little. Uh, they can be conversational, but it's obviously a very well produced S- podcast super. and scripted to a certain degree. Yeah. So like yeah. when Jad and um, when uh, they're just sort of talking, Robert. When, yeah, Robert. When Jad and Robert. Krulwich. Yes. When yeah. they they can start rolling on a topic and it's obviously not scripted, uh, but then they go back into the produced and scripted portions. So yeah. it's like uh, okay, and they're obviously slicing and dicing whatever they recorded. Oh, After absolutely, the fact. yeah. So, because the sound effects that they throw in are amazing, and, and the, there's no the way they did that live. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, it, it's nice to have a mix. Um, I, yeah, I just like I said, I don't know if you do this. I listen to most podcasts about one and a half speed. Oh, I don't. I, oh, yeah. I, but that's a good idea. It started with audiobooks because I would listen to audiobooks at like one and a quarter, one and a half speed. And uh, then the podcast player I used added a speed option. And so I just bumped everything up to one and a half with the exception of Song Exploder. That's the only one I listen to at regular speed. What is that? I don't. That is a podcast where uh, the host um, has on an artist who obviously wrote a song. And they will bring, like, the masters with them and walk the host through the process of recording and and developing the song. It's really interesting, but you can't listen to that sp- sped up because it ruins all right. the listening of the sure. music. So that one's like, okay, that has to be normal speed, but everything else, I'm like, boop, one half speed, go. That's great. It's, I don't know if it's great, but <laughs> let's we get through more podcasts. It sounds like we should be probably bringing it around to you some wanna... kind of a, a relevant mm-hmm. topic to our – whatever our topic was we had a topic. to begin with. Okay. Um, so it's great to be here at the, <laughs> no, it's going to be exciting. It's uh, for me, there's a little bit of a, there's going to be a little bit of a break in period and a learning curve and so forth. Trying Absolutely. to figure out what it is that you guys do. Uh, I agree. And, um, and work and trying to work out, uh, how to, how to, uh, manage all the new tasks that mm. I, I mean, I feel like my workload is basically about to double. With your that. workload that was already running at 200% yeah. is now 400%. Yeah. Yeah, I know that feeling. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's good for us to have to articulate what we do to someone who's not familiar with it because that helps us refine how we think about it. Yeah. So that's important to to us and to you. Um, but, you know, I'm excited to see what comes out of those conversations and how – an Exnet and Propelix and an Exnet company <laughs> will uh, will help peop- help clients and, uh, and like modernize their applications and you know embrace the future of technology. Yeah, I think it's a great marriage. I think uh, we have a lot to offer on the strategy side, mm-hmm. on the mobile strategy side, and on the marketing side and the design side. Right. And you guys have a lot to offer. In the I hope so. Cloud and <laughs> cloud and infrastructure services. and. I mean, we've got some pretty deep uh, app dev resources, too, and we've got the analytics team. So I think there's a lot of cross-pollination that's going to happen. All right, let's shake Um, on it. Let's shake on it. Yes. All right. (laughs) (laughs) That's nothing like uh, visual cues for an audio medium. (laughs) 
All right, and with that, that is our show with Anexapod and Device Squad. Thank you to the marketing team for helping us pull this together. Thanks to Anexnet and Propelix, and Anexnet Company, for helping produce this podcast. If you're looking for more content, you can check out the sister podcast, Buffer Overflow, that I run with oh. my co-host, Chris Hainer, where we discuss new and interesting news in the IT sphere. You can find out more about me and what I'm up to on Twitter at Ned1313 or on my website, nedinthecloud.com. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, IT moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. And thank you, Ned, and thanks to everybody that Ned just mentioned. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix and the Nexonet Company. Bye-bye, everybody.